I think Dorothy Sayers rightly says that we shouldn't call them the seven deadly sins because they're really the roots of the sins themselves. And so it's misleading. So she actually, she says a better term would be the capital sins, the, the heads of all sin. You know, the Muslims borrowed from Aristotle the, uh, the four cardinal virtues and then the intellectual virtues. They added their um, moral virtues. There are seven uh, destructive acts that are mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and some of them are acts that result from these uh, deadly sins. But I, I've thought a lot about it, and I think it's such a exceptional model for understanding uh, human problems. And yeah, I wanted to start by just asking you, I was thinking the other day about the two foundational texts of our tradition uh, in the West, um, arguably, obviously, I mean, there'd probably be dissent on this, but arguably are the Iliad and, and, uh, and, the, and the Bible. And the Iliad begins, it's really about anger. Uh, and it's about one man's <coughs> incredible response <coughs> to, uh, to what he sees as a slight against his honor. And then, um, the Bible is begins with basically the expulsion from the garden, which is rooted in the wrath of God. But if you actually look at it, you know, and I know you've written about this, that wrath and envy, there's, there's a real correlation. And arguably, Agamemnon envies Achilles. And so really at the source, it begins with an act of envy of taking uh, you know, his, his uh, concubine from him. And then, and then the other is uh, the devil's envy of Adam and Eve and their position. So really, more than anger, it's, it, it actually begins with envy. Yeah, and I think in, um, in the tradition that I work out of in, in Aquinas, uh, you know, there's a, the, and at, at the root of envy is also a kind of pride, right? So, um, so you have a, you have, uh, and that's the, that's said to be in the in the Christian tradition with the the reflection on the devil that the devil's sin is one of pride, right? And uh, and uh, and pride breeds envy, which then breeds wrath. The three great the three great spiritual sins. You know, I I thought for some time uh, there's a, a lot of work that you know there's been a great revival in the last uh, say since the early. 70s and 80s with McIntyre's work on virtue. It's been a great revival of the talk about the virtues. And there are all these debates about the unity of the virtues, right? Can you, um, can you have any if you don't have all of them? Uh, right. But you know what, a more interesting topic in some ways is the unity of the vices, right? right. And, and I think particularly with those three, as they're called, spiritual vices, uh, pride, envy, and wrath, that there's a deep interconnection between them. And, uh, and uh, Aquinas and Dante both lay out pretty clearly the, the way in which envy naturally leads to wrath. Uh, and so I think that's, it's not surprising that in these foundational texts, you would find that connection and you would find the sort of archetypal reflection in the Iliad, as you mentioned, and in uh, in Genesis, of the the roots of our disobedience, the roots of our disorder, the roots of our self destructiveness and our destructiveness of our communities, that there would be a deep connection between envy and uh, and wrath. Right, and you know, if our culture does focus on the sins, it's always the carnal sins, which are obviously the lesser sins than the actual spiritual. Um, sins which are much more demonic because they're actually, they're, they're really uh, perversions of nature. So they're love perverted, as you know, they would be looked at as love perverted. And I think, I mean, the Islamic tradition definitely sees pride. There's a debate uh, about this, but is it pride or is it, is it, is it envy? And, and the majority side on, on pride, that pride really start, it kicks it off because the devil is displaying his pride in, in not willing to acknowledge Adam's uh, position. Um, 
There's another very interesting aspect also about pride coming before the fall, right? Uh, and, and then leading to envy because once you fall, it's, it's the one that rises that's really going to trouble you. And, uh, and so, uh, there, you know, I don't know if they, they're, they're definitely all related, but I really do see that, and I think this would, would have been a, a sound understanding in the Catholic tradition, certainly, that unlike the virtues that really are integral to moral behavior, especially the moral virtues, because you can have a, a, a morally virtuous person who's not necessarily intellectually virtuous. But with the sins, it seems to be that people tend to gravitate towards some rather than the others. I think you'd have to be a completely dissolute human being. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned to somebody the other day that, um, you know, my father said by 40, everybody's an expert on at least three of the seven deadly sins. And, 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 I, and you know, we're calling this um, reflection one's enough to kill you uh, because all it takes is one. Uh, and in, 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 in the idea that there are these mortal uh, sins. But I think one of the interesting things about envy to me is the relationship between alienation. So if, if you look at, if, if, if envy kicks it off with, uh, with, with exile, uh, and then you see Cain and Abel, because uh, Cain, in, in some traditions, Cain gave his worst crops uh, in, 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 and, and uh, Abel gave his best sheep. And so he was accepted and Cain wasn't accepted. And then the envy emerges, which leads to wrath and, and he kills him. But then he's exiled to the land of Nod, right? East of Eden. And in, in the Jewish tradition, it's very interesting because they say he sets up the first city and actually demarcates the first uh, boundaries. And so, that leads to Shoek's idea, Helmut Shoek, who, who wrote a, a book on envy that's, uh, I think, I, you, you may have read it, but uh, it's, it's towards a social theory. And one of the things that he argues is that envy is absolutely necessary for the uh, creation of civilization, uh, as well as the sublimation of envy. It's, it's this strange dual nature of the two working together. So I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, I think that's um, that's very interesting. You know, when uh, I was reviewing um, what Aquinas says about envy, and it's, uh, I think we we more naturally see the way in which envy leads to wrath. The insight that Aquinas and a number of other of the ancient and medieval thinkers had is that envy itself is rooted in a kind of sorrow, right? right. It's 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 sorrow over another's good. Now, what you just said about the sublimation of envy is interesting because um, in when Aquinas lays out the various ways in which we can be sad about another's good, the first one that he mentions is actually a virtuous one. Right? We, can, we can be sad over the good of another, and that sorrow is rooted in a recognition that this person is better than I am. Uh, uh, where, you know, the, the vice comes in when I feel like this person is stealing something in terms of honor or wealth that I ought to have, and, and I'm envious and, and I become vicious. But Aquinas thinks that that sorrow, uh, which is rooted in a recognition of another's good, can lead to virtue if we respond to it rightly. So if I respond to the fact that I'm sad that I recognize someone actually is better than I am, right? And we have this experience, I mean, he's thinking mainly of moral, but we have this experience all the time, right? Of recognizing someone's smarter than I am, someone's better at this right. than I am, someone's a better athlete. Uh, and uh, in those areas, particularly where, um, where virtue and vice are concerned, if I recognize and I'm sad about the fact that someone is better than I am, that can prompt me, if I respond rightly to it, to pursue virtue, virtue more assiduously. And right. so, so in, in that sense, this natural comparison that we make between ourselves and others need not be vicious. It's just that because we're fallen, it so often does lead to vice, right? Because right. the sorrow that we feel 
uh, we close in upon ourselves then and think about what we don't have and other people have, and we feel a sense of injustice that's not justified, right? Uh, and, and yet, if we were to, um, to think about it properly and we recognize that someone is better, we might actually try to be a better person. Right, and, that, and I think that gets to the idea that vicious, uh, the way that vicious people admire others is, is through envy. So it's, you know, I think Nietzsche called it the hidden admiration. And, and admiration, if it's healthy, leads to emulation. So the idea that you should really be emulating uh, a person who's superior to you at something, but that is acknowledging superiority. And I think one of the hallmarks of our time is that we don't want to acknowledge the superiority of anyone. There's this, uh, I think, you know, for me, some of the most important philosophers of the 19th century are dealing with the issue of egalitarianism and then also with envy. I mean, it's very interesting that Kierkegaard deals with envy, Nietzsche deals with envy, Schopenhauer deals with envy, uh, and then Marx is, is, I mean, there's an argument that Marxism is deeply rooted in envy of, of, uh, of others because it's really directed the malice, instead of directing the energies at alleviating the conditions of the proletariat, it's all directed at destroying uh, the, 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 the position of, uh, of the bourgeoisie and, and the, the uh, industrial class. So it's, the focus is really a kind of envy. And I think it's fascinating that so many politicians, I mean, this is the politics of envy is is so often brought in to politics. Yeah, this and of course Nietzsche thinks that the entirety of morality is rooted in a kind of resentment, uh, resentment or envy. You know, in a in a more mainstream way, Tocqueville takes this up, right? He takes it up right. in in his discussion of the tension between equality and liberty, right? And we're so focused on equality in modern democracies that we're willing to give up certain types of liberty for the sake of greater equality. And of course, Tocqueville thinks that the, in, a, in a modern democracy, the prudent negotiation of that is what politics ought to be about. Whereas I think Tocqueville worried, and I think we see very often in our own society, uh, a kind of uh, spirit of leveling, right? That, that wants to resist acknowledging that there, there is better and worse. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that kind of extreme focus upon equality uh, and wanting to drag down, I mean, so much of our public discourse, political, cultural, is about taking people who have arisen in some way or another and then bringing them back down, right? And, right. and the, the kind of public castigation, particularly of public figures, uh, we enjoy elevating them into hero status without them having really achieved anything. And then we seem to equally take the light in their fall uh, and the, the leveling that goes on there. So that, um, yeah, that, that uh, the operation of envy in an egalitarian society were really, I mean, uh, 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 in the ancients would say, and the medievals would say, that I envy most the people who are nearest to me, right, in, right. in, uh, in excellence. Uh, and but in an egalitarian society where s supposedly everyone is basically on the same level as me in every area, envy has a much wider uh, arena to operate. Agree. And so it's a much greater and much more pervasive danger for us. I think you're making a really important point because because this is something I've noted in reading the classical literature. Imam al-Ghazali, for instance, or Ibn al-Hajj, one of the great... North African scholar says that envy is always in, in the same uh, social group. So he says, for instance, the, uh, the street sweeper will envy the other street sweeper because he has a better cart than he has. But I totally agree with you. I don't think that's the case. I think they would have to reassess that uh, understanding in today, especially given that lifestyles of the rich and famous my, my grandfather started one of the first um, Hollywood magazines, Greenland magazine, back in the 1920s. And uh, so it's all online. So I was reading one of the articles just out of fun. And it was, it was like 1923. And it said, 
are movies corrupting the morals of America by, by creating these lifestyles that are unattainable for the vast majority of people? So it's interesting. Lifestyles of the rich and famous leads to this thing. An another aspect, which to me is interesting and gets to the heart of what you were just saying, was um, I think Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and others would have seen, maybe nostalgically, but looked upon the heroic age as an age that really at, at, at the heart of that heroic age was this acknowledgement of, of arity, of excellence, of what we call ihsan. And so Homer, you arguably, the, the, the Trojans are more honorable than the, uh, than, than the Achaeans. Uh, Priam and, and uh, Hector, uh, I mean, Paris is a, a kind of pathetic character, but uh, wh when you look at, at the way he looks at his enemy, because he's obviously a Greek, uh, he, he gives them all these noble qualities. And so this ability to acknowledge the nobility of even one's enemy seems to be something of a heroic age, whereas in, 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 in the modern period, there's this idea that you, you really have to completely disparage and denigrate and, and really uh, cancel uh, your, your enemy, not acknowledge any of his worth or goodness or merit. And, and we see this. It's amazing. Somebody can have an extraordinary career, and then they do one thing wrong, and they just cancel them out. Uh, it's, it's, it's that leveling effect that Kierkegaard talks about that is so prevalent in an age of envy. Um, and, and one of the things that um, you know, I taught, I used to use uh, Melville's Billy Budd in a, in a freshman seminar. I've I, I read that several times, and I love that, that work. But... Um, you know, Billy Budd, it's Claggart. One of the things that, um, that Melville says is that, that an arraigned um, prisoner will admit to a felonious crime before he'll admit to envy. <laughs> you know, that it's, it's something really deep in human beings that they will not acknowledge their own admiration, that hidden admiration for another. And I think one of the things that Schopenhauer says is he says that, that the hallmark of the envious person is that they will always mention the bad of a person and be silent when there's merit or good to be mentioned. You know, I was thinking as well, uh, I think that's right. I mean, the question, who or what do you admire or uh, who or what do you look up to, right, is a question that I think if we don't pose it that often. And I think for young people, it's harder and harder to answer, to give an answer to that because of this, this leveling. It, it strikes me, it's, it's also the case, I'm thinking again of, um, of McIntyre's notion of excellence as a good that's intrinsic to a kind of practice, right? So, so there, are, there are goods that are intrinsic to the practice of medicine. There are goods that are intrinsic to the playing of basketball or another sport. And, uh, and the, the way in which we all... Um, pursue those goods and the practices better is by acknowledging types of excellence and attempting to imitate them, right? Well, what happens when we lose that appreciation? And again, even in our opponent, right, we ought to be able to, as you just mentioned, we ought to be able to recognize excellence and sometimes grudgingly, but we ought to, we ought to acknowledge it. The, what happens when you lose that for McIntyre is that the, the practice becomes about the goods that are external, so money, fame, honor, right? These things become more important than the excellence that's intrinsic to whatever the game or the pursuit happens to be or the practice happens to be. And, and I think we see this all over the place in our society. We see it in the corporate world. We see it in medicine. We see where people are losing or sacrificing the pursuit of the excellence of a particular craft for an external good, for competing for honor. Uh, for money, for fame, for popularity. And, uh, and it, it, it does seem to me that that's, that's also connected. I don't know what's cause and effect in this, but it is connected to envy, right? Because if you can't admire the excellence in the performance of another person, what you're doing is thinking about the way in which that person is honored or rewarded in, in what you take to be an exorbitant manner that's detrimental to you.
And I think, so I think there, there's a, a deep connection there. If we can't, as you put it, if we can't acknowledge the excellence, even in our enemy or in our opponent, then we lose the ability to pursue excellence to some extent ourselves. And, and that gets to the idea of the perverted love, that, that, that envy is essentially a perverted love of, of your own good that, that it, 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 it's perverted in, in the love of another's goods and a desire that they lose those goods because somehow that causes uh, some type of loss in your own status and your own position. Uh, one of the fascinating things I think about um, the, the pre-moderns is sumptuary laws. You know, these laws that, that were designed essentially to sublimate envy and, and, uh, and to maintain a kind of Spartan uh, character because luxuria, the, you know, the sin of, uh, of luxuria is one of the seven deadly, you know, what was seen as something that would, would eventually corrode a people to the point where they lose their, their ability to, to regenerate as a culture. And, and, that, and then they, they basically uh, dissipate into a kind of uh, nothingness and arguably, that's kind of happening now, but I, I was struck by the fact that sumptuary laws were, were so universal, like you, you found them all over the world. And, uh, the, you know, the Spartans, for instance, didn't allow their women to wear gold or silver. Uh, the men couldn't wear jewelry. Uh, they could only have um, furniture in their houses that were made with simple instruments like axes. And so they couldn't ornament them as they do, for instance, in this um, fireplace behind me, which is ornamented beautifully uh, in Germany of all places. Um, and, and, and you also had, for instance, in England, I think in the 14th century, uh, one of the kings actually prohibited people from eating meat more than once a day. Um, in our tradition, uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, actually prohibited people from eating meat twice a day. And part of it was to, you know, to prevent luxury from really setting in. But another aspect of it was that you, you, you sublimated the envy impulse, which is very strong in people. Um, I heard from a, a, a Saudi Arabian um, historian told me that one of the reasons why King Abdulaziz had a, a uniform. So all the Saudi men wore that white robe with the either a red or a white ghutra was he didn't want distinction in clothes between the rich and the poor so that the poor didn't feel um, left out. And I think a lot of the sumptuary laws related to dress, we had them here in the colonies. There were sumptuary laws in the, uh, in the 17th century in, uh, in New England. I mean, I, I'm uh, born and, uh, and raised Catholic and went to Catholic grade school and high school and the uniforms that we had to wear are, are meant to serve the same purpose, right? They're, they're often seen today as repressive, but they were, they were meant, in a sense, to erase the difference uh, between more wealthy, more affluent, and, uh, and less affluent families. Uh, and so that everyone, there might, there, there might have been a class structure with upper class students uh, having a different, slightly different uniform, uh, but that was something, you know, where you expected, the expectation was that you would have greater leadership. You would get there. Uh, and, exactly. and that's what you were aiming for in the lower grades. That's a kind of, it's weird, right? Because that's a kind of leveling that is intended to combat envy rather than, an, rather than an, a, a leveling that is the result of envy. In inner city schools, right, where they've tried to, they've had um, principals who've tried to implement um, these dress codes because kids get into fights over tennis shoes. They get into fight. Pe people are killed over these things, you know, and it, it's, it's quite tragic. And so, and there's been a lot of resistance to that because it's very odd. On the one hand, there's this immense egalitarian impulse uh, in, in the dominant culture. And yet on the other hand, there's absolute resistance um, to, to, to aspects that would actually mitigate uh, these these problems of uh, of class distinctions and things like that. So it's it's very it, there's an irony here that I think is lost on a lot of people. Um, you know we we have such an individualistic culture. I mean one of the things that that I I noted when I lived in in North Africa is that people tended they they looked the same outwardly 
and yet inwardly they were they were quite extraordinarily different um, based on just their tastes in um, in poetry and in literature and what they had studied. Um, there was just a lot of depth to the personalities. Where I find in our culture it's quite the opposite. Outwardly there's all these differences. Uh, everybody's displaying their individuality through these outward differences and yet inwardly it's often uh, what one finds is this vacuousness, um, a lack of culture, a lack of, um, of, real, of, of anything that would uh, distinguish them um, other than a kind of popular, and you've written, I think, uh, quite cogently on, on the nihilistic popular culture that we have. I mean, I, your book, I think, is a really important book that you wrote on. Um, it must have been painful doing the research for that, but, and I know you're a little self-deprecating on that, but um, it's interesting because a lot of, of uh, what you see in popular culture actually promotes uh, envy. And, uh, and really, uh, I think the advertising uh, industry is entirely um, driven by the envy impulse. There's an, a new book out uh, by Matt Feeney called Little Platoons. Yeah, Little Platoon uh, from Edmund Burke. Right, yeah. uh, A Defense of the Family in a Competitive Age. And nice. what you said about advertising um, uh, prompted me to think about that book because uh, at, it, he's recognizing that in a middle class to upper middle class families, and, and especially in wealthy families, the, um, from the time uh, their children are young until they get accepted into the elite college of their choice, they are on uh, this, this course where everything is measured in terms of one step of success after another that will lead to acceptance to an elite college. And so he's worried about the hollowing out of the family, right? I mean, Burke's notion of the little platoons is that the, these are these local communities where virtue and excellence and happiness and, uh, and a sense of belonging uh, subsidiary is right, yeah. right, are all emphasized and uh, and encouraged and uh, and fostered, and and yet everything seems to be hollowed out by parents who are in constant competition with one another with their children as instruments of this in a sense, right? Because their children uh, success in this or that arena, and it 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 you multiply the arenas, but all leading to the chance of success of getting into an elite college. Uh, that that the whole of family life seems to be in a way hollowed out, and of course this is there is a kind of advertising campaign that universities and uh, people are engaged in to to get students to do what they need to do in order to be successful at this higher level. You know, it's it's remarkable. I I was working on uh, a piece a couple of years ago about the decline of high school student and college student involvement in the workforce, right? Because this, at least when, when we were young, getting your driver's license and getting your first job yeah. were the two yeah. great uh, avenues of independence and of developing yourself to some extent independently of your parents and your teachers. Right. And now students don't, they, their parents are still driving them around in carpools and they, the participation in the workforce has declined enormously. And it's not that these uh, young people are slackers, right? They're, they're, they're taking a AP courses, they're involved in year-long sports, but they're being constantly monitored by adults and measured uh, in accord with success that will lead to what? To acceptance in an elite college. And so it's not that young people are, it's actually what, uh, what we as adults have done to young people. They're not slackers. They don't lack generosity. They don't lack energy. It's that we, we have taken away the kind of independence that they need and the right. freedom that they need to develop a healthy sense of individuality. Uh, and of course, when they're, when they're tracked along the same track with everyone else, to go back to our topic of today, the occasions for envy in families, uh, from students in classes, in sports, in, in clubs, the occasions for envy are just multiplied. And the prod right. to be envious is multiplied. Alan Bloom, in his writing on Rousseau, uh, and you know Rousseau's notion that um, that 
uh, civilized artificial culture leads me to um, live a life in the imagination of others, right? So, and Bloom says, this is the sort of existence where when I think of myself, I think only of others. And when I think of others, I think only of myself, right? So when I'm thinking of myself, I'm thinking about other people's opinion or impression of me. And when I think about others, I'm thinking about what I can get from them. And this is the, um, this, this is the culture. It struck me what you said about uh, NVIDIA as being a type of disordered or seeing askance, right? Or seeing cross-eyed. I think Tony Esselin has a note about that in his edition of the Divine Comedy. So the Dante symbolizes that by them having their eyes shut. They're also, in, in a way, moving in a way that they have to move together as a kind of chain, right? So, so that the correction is something to the eyesight and also a recognition in the purgatorio of my dependence on others, right? That, and and that's, not, that's not a dependence of what can I instrumentalize others to get out of them, but of a dependence in humanity, right? That I deeply depend upon others so that, you know, authentic friendship would be, for example, one of the great counters to envy. And, and in a society where you see, as we do, declines in authentic friendship, and spikes in loneliness, you would expect that that sorrow that wells up is, it's, it's partly just a sorrow from being isolated, but it's also a sorrow that wells up as I look at images of apparently happy people who are not me, uh, that, that breeds a kind of sad envy that, that I, I, really, I really wish I had what these people have and I don't. That can lead to anger, but it can also just lead to greater and greater depression. And, and alienation, as you mentioned earlier. So I think that um, that that notion of um, how I see others and how I think others see me, right? I mean that the construction, the the line from Prufrock that Eliot uses, a a time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, right? That's what that's what Facebook is constantly about, or Instagram now, which is much more. It's only old people like us on Facebook now. Instagram and 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 elsewhere, uh, but TikTok, yeah. But this this construction of images uh, right. for others, and then the looking at others and seeing their yeah. images, so that um, yeah, it's a uh, it, it is a as you mentioned already, it's a great breeding ground, another great breeding ground for envy. People really are bothered by other people's excellence, by other people's success. The great story that Plutarch tells about Aristides. Um, and I think Kierkegaard mentions that also when he deals with envy, where, you know, he was ostracized from Athens as a, as a punishment. And, and he happened to see a farmer writing on the shard his name to, to ostracize him, to, to exile him, right? And he asked him, oh, what was, he didn't know it was Aristides. And so Aristides asked him, what was his crime? And he said, uh, I I don't know, but I just hate hearing the fact that this guy's the only just man in Athens. So, so he uses that as his kind of, you know, reason for ostracizing him. And, and so there just seems to be this real problem that a lot of people have with the success of others. But one of the things that Epstein points out about the Jewish community in Vienna, he says, uh, consider these rough statistics from the Vienna of 1936 a city that was 90% Catholic, 9% Jewish. Jews accounted for 60% of the city's lawyers, more than half of its physicians, more than 90% of its advertising executives, and 123 of its 174 newspaper editors. And this is not to mention the prominent places Jews held in banking, retailing, and intellectual and artistic life. The numbers four or five years earlier for Berlin are said to have been roughly similar. So when the, the rise of the Nazis, what they did, and one of the reasons that they, uh, the, the ruling class promoted Hitler, they saw him as a lesser of two evils because he was directing the resentment of the poor in Germany. As you know, the Marxists were on the rise in Germany. So he was directing their, their resentment, their envy, their deep envy to this Jewish community. And Thomas Sowell was asked um, by a rabbi, what 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 uh, what would you recommend to the Jews to uh, mitigate the anti-Semitism in this country? And he said failure. 
So it's very interesting that there's just a lot of people that are so troubled. And this is where Shoek says that a civilization will flourish to the degree with which it sublimates that envy impulse because uh, one of the the traditional uh, Christian treatments for envy is in Philippians, where it says, rejoice when when uh, others rejoice and mourn when they mourn. Yeah, that's um, that's beautiful. It makes me think of um, uh, of uh, the way in which Aquinas, although he doesn't draw an explicit parallel between them, but the um, the difference between um, envy and mercy for for Thomas Aquinas, right? They're both rooted in sorrow over another, right? So envy is rooted in sorrow over another's good fortune. That you um, that you despise, uh, and mercy is rooted in sorrow over another's misfortune, right? And it's important for Aquinas. It's tough to get this. It's tough to get the translation of misericordia, right? right. Because it's it's not exactly what we mean by pity. But it's also clear for Aquinas that it's not just a feeling, right? So that it's a feeling that leads to action. It, it, when and where it's appropriate for you to respond, right? So, I, you know, I, 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 I think about, you know, what we might call something like CNN pity, right? Where you're, where you're flipping around the channel and you see some horrible event that's going on in another country or right down the street, and you say, oh, that's awful, and you flip away from it, right? For Aquinas, that's not, that's not mercy. That's not pity in the sense that he's using it. We have to actually want to respond and help where and when we can. But, but that, that's the corrective, in a way, to envy, right, is this, this sorrow over the ability to feel sorrow, not at another's good fortune, where I'm thinking more about myself and how this makes me look bad, but to feel sorrow at those who are less fortunate than I am and to realize that I've been put in a position where I ought to respond to alleviate that misery to... In, in whatever way is appropriate for me. There's no absolute rule there as to what the requirement is for me in a, in a certain circumstance. But that, I think, is an important corrective where I'm, I'm pulled out of myself into a love and service of others through mercy, right? And, and Aquinas actually, you know, they, I think you can see a bit of a, uh, of a criticism of, uh, of even the pagan philosophers here, right? Because... The, the aiming for a certain kind of self-sufficiency through virtue in the pagan philosophers, right? A, a happiness that can't be taken away from me. A, a, Aquinas says at one point about mercy that it is the proud and the self-sufficient right. who, who deem others to justly suffer their miseries, Yeah. right? So this, this judgment that I make, I mean, I can look at people who are doing better than I am and think they don't deserve that. I can look at people who are worse than I am and think they do deserve that. Right. Right. So, um, so this, uh, this, this harsh self-righteous sense of justice or of suffering injustice of myself goes in one direction with those who are doing better and in another way with those who are doing worse. Whereas as we've already talked about, the appropriate response to someone who is better than I am is to say, how can I be more like that person? Right. And the appropriate response to someone who is suffering misfortune that's unjustified is for me to recognize that that could well be me, right? right? Is to recognize, and that, again, that sense of my dependence. Um, Alistair McIntyre in his book, Dependent Rational Animals, spends a lot of time at the end of the book on this notion of misericordia, which he calls just generosity, right? It's a generosity that's actually required of me as a matter of justice, that I recognize in those who are less fortunate than I am a shared human condition. Right. And I don't feel proud at the fact that I am not suffering the same misfortune. I, in fact, feel mercy for those who have suffered what I may well have or may suffer at some point in the future. And I'm moved by our common humanity and my sense of dependence upon God's mercy, especially, to exercise mercy toward others.
you know, I, I read this book by De Mora called Egalitarian Envy. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a very interesting book. But he makes an argument that so much of the, the modern political discourse in the last hundred years is, is really rooted in envy. But at the same time, I think there's a, a, a more liberal critique of that, that that's also a way of not dealing with the real social problems that, that engender that envy, um, that, you know, the 19th century uh, labor laws were horrific and, and we did a great deal to mitigate them, uh, and which is probably one of the reasons why uh, Marx's prediction of the revolution just did not come about uh, in the places that he said that they would come about. And certainly America was one of those places. Whereas now you see America really sliding into a almost 19th century type of condition, um, you know, where, where you have just large numbers of homeless. We've got Hoovervilles all over the place, California. They come to California. And so you're getting at the corporal acts of mercy, you know, this idea that this is one of the ways that we, we mitigate this animus that is engendered by the utter neglect uh, of, of those really suffering because they are suffering and not using as an excuse for their suffering the warrantness of that suffering that somehow they deserve it because you know the undeserving poor was a 19th century term right and uh, Shaw has great fun with that in uh, in Pygmalion but I mean this is a real problem that I think the wealthy, the rich are just in some ways, they, they end up in these bubbles. You know, believe it or not, I actually went to Davos uh, for several years um, to the World Economic Forum. Um, they, they, it's a very interesting place where they have, they bring in people who are religious leaders, intellectual leaders, and then celebrities that hobnob uh, with these uh, incredibly uh, successful uh, industrialists and heads of corporations and heads of state and all these things. But one of the things that really struck me was um, the bubbles that they live in. I don't know if you read Amy Chua. She became famous for the uh, Tiger Mom, I think the homage to the Tiger Mom. But she actually wrote a book, that I, Political Tribes, which I found fascinating. And she wrote another book, uh, which really floored me, which was called... Um, it was called uh, the Triple Package. And she basically looked at all the successful minorities, which are going to be the people that are most uh, susceptible to the envy of the dominant community. And she found that they had three uh, qualities, that, that one of them was a sense of superiority. And the second was a, 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 a feeling of inferiority. And the third was delayed gratification. And, and, and this triple package enabled them to be incredibly successful. So an example of superiority, she says, is like the Cuban community who don't see themselves as Latinos. They see themselves as Cubanos, like they're distinct. And they really, but at the same time, they feel like they have something to prove um, that, that uh, gives them that drive. And, and so you'll have the, like Marco Rubio, if you look at somebody like that, whose parents sacrificed for him to be in the place he's in. When I used to go to Washington, D.C., I'd have these Ethiopian cab drivers, and they would, you know, I'd start a conversation. They would tell me about their daughter who was studying medicine at Harvard or, or Yale, or their son who was at law school. And they had driven a cab so that their children could get out of, of those type of jobs. So I think the American dream is, has become an immigrant, immigrant's dream. Whereas for Americans that are born here, it's become an American nightmare. And so the, the possibility for uh, resentments and envy towards this community is really great. And I think one of the things that, for me, the most important thing, and, and and I would argue in all of these uh, sins is that if we don't have some type of restoration, and I know you and I concur on this issue, but if we don't have some type of restoration of spiritual practices that enable people 
to, to really fight these uh, deep, dark impulses that are human. And, 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 and that's why these ideas are so universal. Uh, the Buddhists talk about the six poisons uh, and, and, uh, and, and we have the seven deadly sins um, that if we don't restore uh, these, these extraordinary traditions that we have that are both spiritual, but they're also profoundly um, uh, rooted in a type of deep psychology uh, that even a secular person could appreciate if they actually knew about them. But there's there's always this, this kind of arrogant, and C.S. Lewis talks a lot about this, this, this arrogance of the new, you know, this idea that we somehow know things that nobody has ever known before. You know, Twain's famous remark is that the ancients stole all their best ideas from us. You know, if we don't go back to these extraordinary traditions that we have, to, to deal with these problems. I just, I, I, it looks pretty bleak to me without that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think one of the, you know, one of the problems with our, um, our, our culture right now is that we've, we're, we've politicized everything at, at the moment when our political discourse is about as low as it could possibly be. And, and, uh, and where it's, um, it's, uh, it's infected with a, um, a kind of deep animosity toward those who disagree with us. And I think one of the things we've politicized in lots of ways is religion. So that if, uh, if religion certainly has political implications, but what you're stressing right now are these traditions of spiritual practice and individual and communal transformation. If, if our focus is not first on those things, and if our focus shifts over toward the politicization of religion, then we're going to end up losing in our religious traditions precisely the things that we need in the long run to um, to be remedies to the the crises right. that we find ourselves in. You know, it, it struck me a while back. You mentioned um, this kind of um, restlessness of the envious, and it's it's interesting that in Aquinas, just before he discusses envy, he discusses sloth or echadia. Right, which is a kind of sorrow over the divine good, right? It's again rooted in a kind of of sorrow, and but it it leads to we tend to think of sloth as laziness, but for Aquinas it can just as much lead to a kind of restless busyness as it can to lethargy, and uh, and so the um, the that that lack of being able to rest in the divine presence, the inability to sense our belonging to God and to a people of God, that leads to envy and to other kinds of restlessness. I, I think that's absolutely true. The, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that, that envy will eat good deeds like fire eats dry kindle wood. Uh, that it's a very corrosive and destructive um, uh, vice. I think Socrates called it an ulcer on the soul, that, that it eats away at the, at, the, uh, at the soul. And I think in many ways it's eating away at the heart of our culture right now. One of the, I think the, 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 the great vice of capitalism is greed, the deadly sin of greed, but the vice of socialism and Marxism is is envy, uh, and 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 so if we don't, I you know I think you're absolutely right that that uh, too often we politicize spirituality, whereas we really need to spiritualize politics, um, and 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 that's that's a very difficult equation uh, because it's so easy to 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 see how. Uh, spiritualizing politics can be corrupted into politicizing spirituality. Well, or even just just focusing upon the extra political, at least in its foundation and in its initial moments, the formative experiences of spiritual transformation, which are uh, which are not primarily political, right? Uh, and they do have political implications. But part of the political implication is what we were saying earlier about the recognition of the need for mercy, the recognition of the need for outreach to 
those who are less fortunate and have need of resources that we may have and the recognition of that common humanity and the common dependence and, and contingency of the goods that we all possess. Yes, uh, uh, in thinking about the things that counteract envy, I mean, certainly mercy is one of those. Generosity or liberality, as the ancients called it, but, uh, but I would think even more gratitude. Right, jo Joseph Pieper, who writes so wonderfully about the the virtues out of out of uh, the tradition of Aquinas, you know, says who the the just person who recognizes his existence as a gift right. will be more inclined to give where there is no clear obligation to give, right? Because that person will recognize in his or her soul that everything that we have is a gift. Right. And so that, that recognition and the gratitude that springs from that recognition uh, is the antithesis of resentment and envy. It's, it's, the, it's the deepest way of cleansing the soul from resentment and envy is to experience one's entire being as a gift. Right? And that experience of one's being, one's existence, and all of the things that one has achieved as gifts should be the thing that frees us from. That's the spiritual formation, right? The spiritual practice of right. gratitude that frees us from envy and frees us from resentment and allows us to gladly give right. to others even where there's no clear-cut obligation. Right. You know, it's interesting. I think that gets to the root of one of the definitions of envy, which is is the um, the disaster of counting other people's blessings. You know that 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 gratitude is counting your blessings, but envy is a result of counting other people's blessings. And and I think gratitude, and also caritas, right? I think that was traditionally seen as the as the primary corresponding virtue to the vice of envy because it's really about love of neighbor it's a perversion and it's very interesting i think that out of the 10 commandments four of them deal with envy really uh, which is quite extraordinary when you when you think about it because murder the, the first murder was out of envy and then you have uh, you know uh, like false witnessing i mean that's claggart Test, you know, his false testimony for Billy Budd. And then coveting, of course. And then coveting your your neighbor's spouse, uh, to use a more politically correct iteration, and 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 coveting your neighbor's goods. There, there's a, I mean, obviously a lot of this is this could be go on for a, a, a great deal of time, and, and obviously, uh, both of us have thought a lot about this this uh, problem. I think. Uh, one, one of the most interesting things in, in, uh, in the Islamic tradition to me is, is they say, al-hasud la yasud. Enviers never get into positions of, uh, of, of power or authority or uh, responsibility, that it, it really obviates that possibility. And there's a lot of envy uh, in many places that are not successful as countries. Like you really see it. There's, there's places, I know uh, a friend of mine who lived in a, uh, one of the Muslim countries said that at night people would sneak in new furniture because they were so worried about what the Spanish call mal ojo, you know, the evil eye. Uh, Aquinas talks about the evil eye and tries to give it a rational explanation through the humors. But the evil eye is, it's everywhere. Uh, in all these global cultures, you will find J Japanese, the Feng Shui, a lot of it is to remove the evil eye. And then we forget that the demons envy us. I mean, they're really envious at, at the root of the demonic assault on our species is envy. Um, in, in India, in Northern India, they have these beautiful trucks that they adorn, that they drive on these roads. And on, and on the on the back of the truck, you know, it's got this uh, nazar uh, wale uh, teramu kala, you know, like uh, something like that. I'm probably probably mangling the pronunciation, but it's you know, if you give me the evil eye, may your face turn black, because people see the trucks and they and they desire the trucks. And so again, 
you know, religion gives us an awareness of this sin that our, our civilization seems really loath to even discuss. Uh, I mean, Shakespeare has Othello. I think uh, Ben Stiller did a, a film called Envy, but it's, it's really not really addressed in popular culture to the degree with, 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 with which it should be. And so this conversation, I hope, is, uh, is, is a way of, uh, you know, for, for those who hopefully will see this, just a way to get people to think about uh, these problems because they are real problems, they're social problems. No, this was great, thank you. <laughs>